FBI has arrested 10 people for allegedly spying for Russia for up to a decade. Most of them spent decades blending in with American society. A long-term FBI investigation. 10 suspected sleeper spies. They just seemed like a nice, just quiet sir, just... family. Their whole goal was to disappear, literally disappear into a community and not be recognized for who they are. This is a different world. This is the world of those who are involved in trying to be able to hurt our country. Every American who watches this is going to ask the question, who can I trust? As a former FBI agent and chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, I had oversight of all 16 of our nation's intelligence agencies. My name is Mike Rogers. I had access to classified information gathered by our operatives, people who risked everything for the United States and our families. You don't know their faces or their names. You don't know the real stories from the people who lived the fear and the pressure until now. Nineteen sixty. That's the year our technical experts thought Russia would finally be able to develop a bomb. 1949 is when they had their bomb. Credit Russian espionage agents aided by national traitors. Spying is uh, something that's been with us uh, throughout history. And it's been particularly true with the Russians, going back to the Soviet Union and the Cold War. They had their spies, uh, we had our spies. And the reality is that Russia remains an adversary of the United States. They aren't the superpower confrontation that the Soviet Union was all about, but they represent the direct opposite in terms of our values. They're engaged in aggression around the world. Russian airstrikes are intensifying in what the rebels call a scorched earth policy. Look at the strength of Russia. Look at this, innocent people being killed. And with Putin, uh, we're involved in a new chapter of the Cold War. CNN has just learned that there is renewed confidence that Russia is in fact behind the cyber break-ins. The role of intelligence needs to evolve. It's no longer where are the plans for the invasion of the tanks through Europe. It's how does one country get a leg up on another. The active measures taken by the government of Vladimir Putin to influence and to potentially manipulate American public opinion for the purpose of discrediting individual political figures, sowing chaos and division in our politics, sowing doubts about the legitimacy of our elections. For a country that wants to be a superpower again, intelligence can be the most important kind of power. So that's why it is important for the United States to be aware of what they're up to so that uh, we can anticipate their actions and take steps to protect our country. There are various ways the Russians develop effective spies. They deploy people to this country under a diplomatic uh, passport. A Russian diplomat, uh, or diplomats for that matter, come into our country and are located at the various embassies. Some of them are spies. Aren't all diplomats spies? No. <laughs> uh, the diplomatic service of any country, including the diplomatic service of the United States, serves an important function. It's for countries to be able to communicate and interact with each other. However, some of them were spying. <laughs> But even Russians who are located at the various embassies that are involved in spying, it's pretty obvious that they're already suspect. The United States is fully aware of uh, who they are. So if I want to penetrate another country, the best cover for a spy is the ability to blend in and just be another citizen. An illegal the agents who quietly blend into the societies of other nations and lead seemingly normal lives while secretly carrying out orders passed to them from Moscow. 
The term illegal is an intelligence term of art that refers to somebody who is here not under, with any kind of diplomatic status, that is here not in true name. They are career intelligence professionals. They are given advanced training in tradecraft, clandestine activities, and then they ultimately spend years serving abroad in order to become someone they're not. These are teachers, travel agents. They're in real estate. They're going to rotary clubs. Your first reaction is, this is just an ordinary joke. They can live unnoticed in the shadows with a specific purpose. They spot and assess people with access to information. They start a relationship with them. They learn what kind of person they are, what their interests are, what their vulnerabilities are. All to gain access to classified information, political, academic, financial, from friends, employers, uh, co-workers. They could ultimately provide some very important intelligence to the Russians. And if you want to know what an illegal agent looks like, step out of your house and look at your neighbors to your right and look at your neighbors to your left, and that's what they look like. That's what makes illegals such a dangerous intelligence tool. In the early 2000s, the FBI became aware of a group of illegals who had form deep cover lives in American society. This illegals network included four couples operating throughout the United States. And that was significant because to find one would be a career maker. To find multiple illegals, stunning. How did you learn about them? Unfortunately, that remains classified. But I could tell you that any foreign government that spends resources to insert an entire network of trained intelligence officers here, that's a threat that we take seriously. At any time, the illegals could meet that person with access to information and a vulnerability that could allow the Russians the opportunity that they were looking for. Some of them were in place in the financial industry, and some of them were at colleges and universities across the United States. That gives them access. This gives a rare glimpse into the world of counterintelligence. We conduct investigations like this every day. But rarely does it get publicity because of the secret enclave that we work in. And this is the first time where we've been able to tell our story, tell the story of this investigation. In the early 2000s, the FBI became aware of Russian intelligence officers who had formed deep cover lives in American society, known as illegals. These agents were deployed to become American, to gain trust of people in order to spy for their country and against the United States. The illegal is in place looking for an opportunity. It's the long game. You never know when they'll be in the right place at the right time. It was our goal to identify them, monitor, and ultimately neutralize their operations. We had many field offices working these cases. It included Seattle, Chicago, Washington, New York, Boston. I was assigned to the New York office in 2005. Our squad was responsible for the New York area couples. The one thing to understand is that if one of these cases went down, it had the potential to affect all the rest of them. So it was imperative that we kept all of the field offices uh, connected to each other. Todd and myself, our job was to set kind of a national level strategy so that each field office understood the trends. What was happening with one couple was pertinent to another couple. In 2003, I became an agent, graduated from the academy, and was assigned to the Boston field office. You know, we had a front row seat to the SVR's most highly valued and most secret program. We had identified Richard and Cynthia Murphy who were living in New Jersey. Donald Heathfield and Tracy Foley living in Boston, Massachusetts. Juan Lazaro and Vicky Pelaez in New York. Michael Zatoli and his wife, Patricia Mills, who at that time were living in Washington State. In each and every case, the FBI used all of the tools in its toolbox to learn as much as they can about their residences, their habits, Physical surveillance, including clandestine searches, was conducted. We started covert entries into the residence, 
goal was to find whether there was any evidence of tradecraft and figure out exactly how they were communicating with Moscow Center. But that is a very high risk operation and that's the point um, at which the most things can go wrong for us. We had to be very careful not to upset traps when we went into places. Foreign intelligence officers will do certain things like vacuuming your rug as they back out of the door so they can see if anybody came in or not. So it was a, a major, major point in the investigation when we would do that because so much was at stake for us. We saw a lot of similar things with these couples. During the searches, we found invisible ink. They had specially treated paper. They had the shortwave radios. These were materials that the illegals were using to communicate back with the SVR, the headquarters of which was referred to as center. What kind of information were they sending? The invisible writing and the shortwave radio broadcasts, they are essentially unbreakable. We couldn't see into their communication system. At certain times, we did have um, a microphone in the house. So we were always monitoring what they were, might be doing in their routine lives, how they talk to their children, how they talk to each other. Many of their children were not aware of the fact that their parents were spies. They really had assumed these notional identities and that was who they were day in and day out. In fact, the Murphys at home, we never heard them use Russian. So they kept to their legend even where they thought they were by themselves. What is a legend? Backstory, it's their persona, it's their identity and everything that goes along with it all of which is fake. Legend building takes place over the course of years. Russia has whole offices devoted to doing this. Some of the identities are completely fictitious, like the Murphys, but in the case of the Boston couple, Heathfield and Foley, they are what we call a dead double. Someone identified a deceased Canadian infant and they steal that identity and build an identity around it using original documents that they request from Canadian authorities who don't know who they're sending them to. And once you have the birth certificate, then you can get a driver's license, you can start getting passports, credit history, college degrees. And then after living in Canada for several years, they came to the US as Canadian citizens on their Canadian passports. Got a student visa and then a business visa. They established a foothold in the US to get citizenship in the United States. And, and they're ready to rock and roll at that point. Part of the legend building process is obtaining a mate. Before they are ever deployed, Russia sets them up as couples. So it would be like me going to Quantico and being partnered up with another FBI agent to become married and go live in another country under assumed names. It requires serious commitment. <laughs> so, you know, Did what? they love each other? I think so. They are humans just like us, and they are subject to the same trials and tribulations that life brings on. In the Murphy's case, you know, they had their arguments. We would listen to them interact, and she would be busy at work, and she would call home and ask him, can you pick up the children from the play date? And he would mutter something about being busy, you know, I'm vacuuming or something. And then, you know, we would hear, you know, he's watching The Sopranos. <laughs> so, you know, to everybody, watching them, and even to us, who monitored them every day for years, they did seem very, very normal. No government makes that type of investment unless they see a real benefit for their intelligence arsenal that they want to maintain. In the course of the investigation, we saw several transfers of cash, lots of cash, to keep them operating. In 2004, it came to the FBI's attention that an illegal traveler operating under an assumed name, Christopher Metzos, was in the United States. We believe Christopher Metzos operated from the Russian Federation and was dispatched for several months at a time to the U.S. in order to supply money and tradecraft materials to the illegals operating in the United States. How did the FBI become aware of Christopher Metzos? That remains classified. Christopher Metzos was being tasked to meet with the Russian diplomat. And uh, the FBI was waiting for them. On May 16th, 2004, on the stairs of the Forest Hill Station of the Long Island Railroad, Metzos, moving up the stairs, conducts what's called a brush pass with a Russian diplomat. 
Identical bags are exchanged between the diplomat who's traveling down the stairs and Metsu's. And now the money has, in essence, gone black. It's moved from official Russian diplomatic channels into the intelligence world. Later that same day, Christopher Metsos, now in possession of what we believe to be a quarter million dollars, meets Richard Murphy, passes him almost half the cash to sustain his operations. And then GPS shows that Metsos's car traveled approximately 80 miles north of New York City to a small rest stop in Worthboro, New York. Metsos buries the final portion of the money at the base of a pole underneath an inverted brown bottle. Agents in New York set up cameras to monitor that drop. The implement of that camera became a whole new case, separate code name. We didn't know how long it would be there. But we had to be ready to document that whenever it happened. The whole role of intelligence agencies is to be ahead of the game and not to be surprised. If you are surprised, then the chances are that you fail to do your job. In May of 2004, Christopher Metzos buried a large amount of cash at a rest stop in Würzburg, New York, specifically to support the U.S.-based illegals. These were deep cover officers who were here to spy on the U.S. and to benefit Russia. We had installed a camera pointing straight down at that site so that if anybody had come to disturb that, we would have video of it. The operation of illegals is a long game. Significant events occurred only a couple of times a year. But we couldn't allow ourselves to become complacent. We knew what they did yesterday, but we didn't know what they were going to do tomorrow or next week. One of the next big events occurred in June 2006, when Michael Satoli traveled from Washington State to New York and unearthed the dead drop, which Christopher Metzos had filled two years before. Satoli now has a significant amount of cash to fund his living expenses in the United States, uh, and continues intelligence work. And after that, we spend a lot of time just watching. The question we get frequently is, what are we waiting for? We weren't waiting for anything in particular. We just couldn't break the covert communication that the illegals were using to communicate with their handlers in Moscow. And one of the challenges is trying to stay current with whatever technology that they're using at the time to talk to center. The Murphys had a box that we used to call the Tradecraft box, which was essentially a shoe box with all of their gear in it. And that made it very convenient for us. We would go there on the entries, we'd find their notes and we'd find their discs within this Tradecraft box. We copied anything that we thought would be of intelligence value. Photographs were made of documents, files, any type of computer or electronic equipment was copied so that it could be reviewed in greater detail later. The Murphys had been in the United States since the 90s. It was so long that their spycraft evolved from very early forms of covert communications all the way up to the steganography. Steganography was a system that we saw developed in the mid-2000s, and it uses special encryption software to digitally encrypt text that's converted into a color photograph that is then put on a web page online. And it's there for anyone to see. So you and I could go on a web page and be looking at a picture with steganography in it and not realize it. It was essentially unbreakable if you don't have the key that the illegals do. One of the major breaks came when the New York field office began to piece together information from their physical searches, which they had conducted in 2005 looking at the computer with steganography on it. There was a password, which was 27 characters long, for security. In reviewing the information in the notebooks, they found a strange system of numbers and letters, which they believed to be computer keystrokes. Through trial and error, they repeatedly entered these characters and ultimately entered what was the 27-digit password. So if your company IT guy tells you, don't write down your password, that's why. For us, that was a game changer. Once we got our own version of their system, we could run a parallel version and read the same things that they were reading. Now we had context. Now we had transparency. For the first time, rather than 
looking from the outside in, we had an opportunity to really understand what they were doing from the inside out. Moscow would often send them specific tasking to go after certain pieces of information, either current event developments, presidential races, things happening at different agencies. It included names of hundreds of people that the illegals thought could have access to classified information. We saw Donald Heathfield make contact with a Department of Energy official who worked on nuclear weapons as well as a former national security official. And we saw SVR Center in Moscow directing him to gather information on personal habits, family, hobbies, any biodata that he might gather. So we were constantly looking to see who he's in touch with, what's the status of that relationship, because he's going to meet someone that is going to be the keys of the kingdom, and that will make the 15 years worthwhile. In 2006, we learned from the Canadian Secret Intelligence Service that they intended imminently to arrest an illegal operating as a Canadian of the name of Paul Hempel. After the arrest of Paul Hempel, the Russian government became concerned about the U.S. government's ability to ferret out false Canadian documentation. In the case of Christopher Metzos, that documentation was used to support his travels throughout the United States. So the SVR stopped sending him. And that meant the SVR had to find new ways of funding the U.S.-based illegals. In monitoring Richard Murphy's communications, it became clear that the SVR was going to task a credentialed Russian diplomat to meet with Murphy. So he was sent a message via the steganography on how to conduct this rush pass at the White Plains train station. Who was the Russian diplomat? Yeah, I can't say. The exchange happened midpoint on the stairs. The Russian diplomat removes a small satchel from the bag and places the bag into Murphy's open backpack. In that bag, we assess there have been approximately $300,000 in U.S. currency. The theory of the illegals program is that they have no connection to the Russian government. When Richard Murphy conducted a brush pass with a Russian government official, that tied him to the Russian government. It was a big break in the case because that gave probable cause should we ultimately interdict the illegals network. One interesting note that we saw in a later message, and we always suspected this, would be that the Russian intelligence services would be monitoring that area to see if they could spot any FBI. And uh, we saw in a message that basically a kudos to Richard Murphy that we were looking and we didn't see anything, which we all high-fived ourselves because they didn't spot us. There's an old phrase about counterintelligence and espionage that it's a wilderness of mirrors that you go into that fun house hall of mirrors and all of a sudden you've got the one side is watching us, we're watching them watch us, and no one's trying to get caught. Years and years went by during the course of the investigation without compromise. But I don't know how many times you can roll those dice and, and not have a mistake made that will just end this thing. And the pressure of that weighed on all of us. June 6, 2009, the FBI documented that Richard Murphy received money from a Russian official. So that was a big break in the case because that officially tied him to the Russian Federation. After the brush passed, half of that $300,000 was intended for Richard Murphy to deliver to Michael Zatoli. In September, Michael Zatoli and Richard Murphy met in Brooklyn. It was supposed to be another brush pass, but as it turned out on that day, the two met on the corner and they ended up sitting down on a park bench and meeting for hours. As part of the illegals program, the illegals were not to have contact with each other because compromise of one could result in the compromise of all. So this was a pretty significant breach in protocol. And what we think they were doing was just relating to each other. You know, when you look at how this case developed, there's very short bursts of operational activity. You do two exciting things a year at best. And this was an opportunity for two illegals who had the same mission to come together and talk about it. Aside from your handlers, you are the only one who knows who you actually are. For an opportunity to sit down with a fellow illegal and share stories on a park bench for more than an hour and a half must have been a pretty significant event in, in uh, Zatoli and Murphy's life. You know, they have emotions. And I always think it's important in these kinds of global affairs where we compete with adversaries around the world 
that every once in a while we stop and think about the humanity involved and the fact that there really are human beings who become weapons of both countries. That's what they really are. After years and years of watching these people, we started to see a change. As it became harder and harder to document fictitious people, the SVR advanced and developed their tradecraft. And we started to see a new generation of illegals who could withstand the scrutiny of travel into and out of the United States with their own identities. Anna Chapman and Mikhail Semenko came to the United States utilizing their true names and their true documentation. What they didn't reveal was their affiliation with Russian intelligence services. Mikhail Semenko arrived in the United States to attend Seton Hall University. Semenko spoke five languages and was spotting and assessing people that had access to national defense information. Anna Chapman had married a citizen of the United Kingdom. She had obtained UK citizenship through that marriage and had maintained his name after her divorce. She was a real estate agent who was using contacts within Manhattan. A lot of these were party type contacts. And so she spent a lot of time out, you know, at bars and she spent a lot of time out at parties. We all knew where this was headed, that at some point, one of these agents would attempt to infiltrate the State Department or the CIA or the FBI or some sensitive agency in Washington and locate there for the purpose of spying. We knew what they were doing. We knew what their mission was. It's one thing for us to believe that. It's another thing to see it in writing. What we needed was a specific tangible piece of proof that they were spying for the Russian government. Fortunately for us, in one of the intercepted COFCOM messages, we learned exactly what the Russians believed the whole purpose of this operation was. Richard Murphy had been involved in a dispute about expenses. Because he was arguing that they owned the house, they had purchased it, and the SVR Center was reminding them that your mission is to live there. This is part of that, we own the house. And then he was curtly reminded of exactly what it was he was supposed to focus on. You were sent to the USA for long-term service trip. Your education, bank accounts, car, house, etc. All of these serve one goal, fulfill your main mission. I.e. to search and develop ties in policy-making circles in US. And send intels to see. C stands for center. I can't overstate how important that was. You know, it's like looking at a watch work on the inside for 10 years and really understanding the evolution of the program, the purpose, what it was for, sort of how they built it, how they funded it, how it was structured, um, how they ran it. Simultaneously, we saw several things start to develop and reach a crescendo where we felt it was a time to step in. One of the things that we learned was that Moscow was directing the illegals, which included the special agent illegals, Chapman and Semenko, to migrate closer to policymaking circles, specifically Washington, D.C. And the longer that it ran, the more concern that I got that there would be a compromise of this particular illegal network. Sometimes you can do everything right and have some unforeseen circumstance, and all of a sudden, all that success, a decade, of stellar intelligent work winds up being ashes in our mouth. And ultimately the decision was made, let's end it on our terms. This was a massive operation that went for over a decade. The cases were spectacular, but ultimately we had watched them long enough where we believed we had learned as much as we could possibly learn about their operations. One of the things that we learned was that Moscow was directing the illegals to migrate closer to policymaking circles, specifically Washington, D.C. And the FBI came to our offices at Langley when I was uh, director of the CIA and briefed me in terms of what 
these agents were up to. And that's when we focused on the prospect of going out and arresting them. And coming up with a plan that would not have a negative impact on bilateral relations. On the policy front, we were supposed to be getting closer to Russia. President Barack Obama had come into office, and it was part of his foreign policy initiatives to develop a rapprochement with the Russian government. That we can make extraordinary progress uh, that will benefit uh, the people of both countries. So it was a very delicate political time. In this particular case, suggesting that we interdict and potentially prosecute and jail 10 Russian government officials was unprecedented. So it required approvals at the highest levels of government. And that resulted in a series of meetings in the Situation Room in the White House. Were you nervous? It was one of the longer years in my career. The concern that was raised was, what is this going to mean in terms of this relationship that uh, the United States was trying to develop with Russia? And there were some who thought that it might blow up the relationship because we're suddenly arresting 10 spies in our country. But when we talked about this in the National Security Council, I said, this is an old story. They've been spying on us. We've been spying on them. Every once in a while, we find their spies. Every once in a while, they find our spies. This is not going to be a big deal. Both countries will continue their relationship. The president concurred that we ought to make this effort. And it was accepted that we would resolve this case through prosecution. We aimed to build a case that would be able to be presented in court. And this was one of the biggest challenges. Prosecution and counterintelligence almost never happens because your best cases come from sources and methods that you want most to protect. So we needed a charge for which we could produce evidence that we were prepared to divulge to the U.S. public. Starting 2006, we had slowly started to compile folders of evidence that the subjects were in violation of the Foreign Agent Registration Act. Upon arrival in the United States, they should have registered with the U.S. government that they are, in fact, Russian officials here in the U.S. And by neglecting to do so, they were in violation of U.S. law. We had a number of white-collar fraud charges. Their bank accounts, home mortgage, car loans, each of those is a separate count of wire fraud, identity theft, bank fraud. Each count is like five years in prison, so you had a big hammer. While all the rest of this is going on, we also had to develop charges on Anna Chapman and Mikhail Semenko. They were different. They were here in true name. A number of the charges didn't apply to them. And what we utilized in both cases was a false flag. A false flag is basically introducing someone to them who they believe to be a Russian official and seeing if they will do something. So two independent FBI undercover operations were launched. In Washington, Semenko was being tasked to meet. They met on a park bench. He was handed cash and then told to go put the money under a bridge. He puts it right under the bridge on video, leaves it there. He fell right for his, his false flag. At the same time in New York, Anna Chapman met with an undercover FBI agent who passed her a passport and told her to pass it along to somebody like her who needed to get out of the country. She leaves the meeting and she panics. Something came over her where she started realizing that something wasn't quite right. And we believe that she was quickly processing that she may have come to the attention of the FBI. We were very concerned that if she sent a distress signal to the SVR, they may in turn send an emergency signal to all of the illegals and we would lose them all. So the next morning she shows up at the first precinct in Manhattan and she reports that someone's tried to get her to do something with the passport. It was very strange. At the same time, President Medvedev was at the G20 in Canada and we wanted to wait until he was out of this hemisphere uh, in order to effectuate the, the arrests because it would not be proper to have that done during an international economic event. Investigators in New York were doing absolutely everything they could to stall Anna Chapman. So we sent two agents to pretend they were detectives and kept her there all day looking at mugshots, knowing she was never gonna find the person. 
because he was an FBI special agent working undercover. We were all a little nervous. Nobody wanted to mess this up on the last day. The success or failure was really in the hands of the field level investigators, and we had one chance. We had been on 24-hour physical surveillance for a couple of weeks. Everyone's kind of sitting in their cars in all the different field offices, um, just waiting for the go-ahead. This will define FBI counterintelligence in the eyes of the American people, in the eyes of Congress, and more importantly, most importantly, in the eyes of our adversary. And if we made it a success, we plant a flag not only for FBI counterintelligence, but the U.S. intelligence community of exactly what our capabilities are. But if we screwed this up, it would be a big, big problem. June 27th, Sunday night, Donald Heathfield and one of his sons was scheduled to board a plane to leave the United States. We think ultimately work his way to Moscow for an operational meeting. And if we miss that window, we wouldn't have another opportunity to catch everyone in the United States for months. But even more importantly, on that night, Christopher Metzos, who we hadn't seen in the United States since 2006, was traveling in Cyprus. So the FBI is in a position to capture all of these illegals at once. We waited until the conclusion of this summit in Canada. We waited until the Russian president had left Canadian airspace. And then we moved on that Sunday night. The arrests were June 27th, Sunday night. And we had one chance. We waited until the Russian president had left Canadian airspace, and then we moved. Everybody got the go sign. This is happening to Anna Chapman at the police precinct, and in Boston, in Washington, and in Yonkers, New York, all at the same time. We knocked on the door. They were having dinner. We told them they were under arrest. There was no drama. There was no shouting. We got all of them that we were had been watching. There were no difficulties at all. There wasn't a shock, like, what are you doing? Why are you here? They just kind of looked like, oh, today's the day. Their 20-year odyssey, I think they didn't even come to an end pretty quickly. Arrangements were made after the arrest for the children of the illegals. Most of these children thought that they were U.S. citizens. This was home. And suddenly they're finding out that their parents are spies uh, from Russia. It was critical to us that the children be cared for in a compassionate way. The FBI arrested nine illegals and one co-conspirator. Donald Heathfield, Tracy Foley, Patricia Mills, Michael Zatoli, Richard and Cynthia Murphy, Juan Lazaro, Anna Chapman, Mikhail Semenenko, and Vicky Pelaez. In addition, an Interpol warrant was filed, which subsequently led to the arrest of Christopher Metzos in Cyprus. Christopher Metzos was offered bail and fled shortly thereafter. He's still out there. This photo shows FBI agents in Montclair, New Jersey. Two of the suspects live here, apparently with their two young daughters. We had no idea. They just seemed like a nice, just quiet sort of, just, family. Well, this is such a throwback to sort of I Spy and uh, yeah. you know James Bond. All of the couples were held within the various different correctional facilities in Boston, New York, and Washington. The question then became, would this be, in the tradition of spying, an opportunity to trade? Why not use them as chips in order to be able to get back some people who had actually uh, been willing to put their lives on the line to do their job of spying? It was an interesting opportunity for a director of the CIA, particularly somebody who kind of, you know, loves spy movies and uh, was thinking about it. And I thought, you know, for God's sakes, I'm, I'm now in the middle of what would be a great movie about the effort to try to trade for spies. One of the biggest questions that we had was whether or not the Russian Federation would acknowledge that they are, in fact, Russians. I got on the phone with my Russian counterpart, Mikhail Fradkov, who was right out of central casting for a Russian spy. I put him on the speakerphone, and I said, uh, Mikhail, 
I want you to know that we're aware that they're your people. I looked around the room, and our people waiting, you know, as to what Fratkoff would say, because there was this, there was this silence. And then Fratkoff said, yes, they are our people. And you could see all the jaws drop in the room, <laughs> and the fact that he was acknowledging that they were Russian spies. That was very important because had he not, it may have had a different judicial outcome, meaning this may have gone to trial. I said, look, we would like to work out an exchange. And he agreed to those next steps. The FBI had made arrangements so that all of the, the prisoners had been transferred to New York. And they were promptly told that they are free. They would be returning to Moscow. Children were taken care of, transported to be reunited with their parents. The spy swap has been made, the biggest U.S.-Russian spy swap since the Cold War. Do you still watch them? Um, wow, not expecting that one. <laughs> Do we still watch the illegals that we arrested? Yeah. Um, we are aware of them. This was a once-in-a-career case. The caliber of people working in this case were unique. The ability to talk about it in the way that we're talking about it now is incredibly unique. It's just unprecedented, in my opinion. We consider it to be one of the greatest counterintelligence successes in our modern history, and one of the largest, most compartment-sensitive cases in the FBI's history. For most people who are sitting at home and trying to think about what the hell this is all about, uh, in many ways, this is about humanity in the 21st century and what we do to try to make sure that somehow we can protect our interests in a very complicated world and how we use ordinary human beings to do that job.